today's word is efficacy. And if you listen to this podcast, you know I butcher stuff. So I went on to the Google and played this. Efficacy. I think I'm saying it right. Yeah, I've just got this hearing thing that I found out when I was in college. I used to, you know, I went to UC San Diego, got a degree in physiology. And I did well in science. And the reason I did well in science was because there was a textbook. Like I basically taught myself calculus, even though I wasn't the greatest math student. I really enjoyed calculus. But when I was at UC San Diego, you know, my first professor was like a German with a heavy accent. And then the other guys had heavy accents too. So I just got the book, did all the problems, found as many tests as possible. And so it's kind of like, I say I almost have like hearing dyslexia. I used to never really understand people saying, oh, you know, reading dyslexia and it gets all jumbled up when it goes in my head and so it also affects the way i speak i think often and so i you know i was taking science classes i was doing okay but in a class where there was just a lecture man i was just the worst i was interested in the subject and it's weird like when i'm in my day-to-day -day life you know i listen to people and tell, talking stories and talking it seems okay but man definitely have that uh, issue. So efficacy is the ability to produce a desired or intended result. And you've probably been hearing this word in the news lately with the uh, vaccines and the efficacy of the various vaccines. And I've been talking about Pfizer vaccine in my case, where I've now got my second dose on Friday. And, you know, when I got the first dose, I definitely felt like my defenses were building up. So I think the mRNA was doing a good job. I don't know why I've been itching my nose so much. I think it's because We've got a change in the weather here. It's gonna be 80 here in Bakersfield, and I'm sure the plants are blooming and hay fever is coming. So <clears throat> I um, you know, just took that thing and I've been having my sleep really, really disrupted. I kind of first chalked it off to daylight savings time, but that only lasts a few days and then I'm good to go. So thankfully I just had a nice nap since I only slept about three hours last night. So the reason I'm using this word efficacy is I saw this really good article on, on I Run Far, and they're a great website. I remember meeting Byron Paul Powell years ago when he was driving his Prius through the mountains of various Southern California races. I remember seeing him at Ray Miller and other races and got to know him fairly well. In an article they call a running new, new running superpower, self-efficacy. What is self-efficacy? See, I'm screwing it up now. It's a belief in our abilities to accomplish a specific task. And I'm not sure why, because I didn't have the greatest of childhood, but I definitely have the ability, the self-efficacy, and I think it's more like because I've had this entrepreneurial spirit. Never really had a real job except for teaching high school for two years in South Central LA when I first got out of college, and then pretty much I've owned my own businesses, and so I've always had um, known that I can, you know, do a task, you know, in the business world. Um, and wherever else, in school and things like that. I've just kept working at it and I wasn't afraid to try things and I wasn't afraid to fail. And I think that's the biggest issue. And I've been on Clubhouse now, which I know you're probably already tired of me talking about, but you know, I'm listening in on things and it's amazing how many people are just talking about, you know, I wanna do a podcast, I wanna do YouTube, I wanna do, you know, this, that business. And you can tell that, you know, they want to, but they just don't have, uh, you know, what it is is they're afraid to fail. And they're afraid of being embarrassed. And I just say, you know, you've got to have a belief. And that's what he's talking about, a belief in your abilities to accomplish a specific task. And, you know, and it translates into sports. Sure, in sports, my talent will only take me so far. And so, you know, kind of how I got into running. I had a belief in my abilities in baseball. The coaches didn't. And so my sophomore year, I walked off the field and went out for the track team, broke five minutes in the mile, and the rest was history. So when I had my record store for years and years, I had people coming in with great ideas. They wanted to open businesses. They wanted to be a musician. They wanted to, um, you know, be a professional skateboarder and all these things. And I was just always used to say, go do it. You know, if you fail, you fail. And they'd say, well, you know, now is not the time. And one of the few things, lessons I did get from my dad was he said, you know, there's never a good time to try, you know, there's never a good time to try anything. So just do it. And definitely that's how it is. So in this article, they're talking about, you know, ultra running is hard, both physiologically and psychologically. And of course, you know, everyone kind of knows that. And there's often a say it's ultra running is 80% mental. And I truly believe it because as you can see, and I'm not the physical specimen I am, but you know, when it gets, and that's kind of why I like it, ultra running. Um, you know, when I was fast and young, running 250 marathon, you know, I like the shorter races and get to go home. But, you know, I always compare shorter races like anything under 50 miles. It's like checkers. You know, checkers is a pretty simple game. It's pretty straightforward. You look at the starting line. 
in a marathon or down especially and you can pick out who's going to win it's going to be the lean skinny people you know the fit people and you know you get to 50 miler and things start changing in fact that's why i really don't think of a 50k as an ultra yes it's past a marathon but i often tell people if you run a big city race you know you walk a mile or two to the starting line you don't get to run the course on the tangents so you end up running 27 plus miles and then you walk a mile or two back to your car you got a 50k and I often noticed when I started doing ultras, the 50 milers was my first race, and I still liked them. You know, about 35, 40 miles, that's when I'd start catching people who had the physical tools, but just hadn't learned the lessons and how to take care of themselves. So it's definitely, you know, those mental challenges are there, and you need to just work on them. And so this whole point of self-efficacy is, you know, the abilities to accomplish a task. You know, you just got to believe you can do it, you know, and it's kind of like believe it and you can achieve it. I'm sure the gesture would be giving me a high five right now. We can all probably think of a moment late in a run or a race where we simply knew we're going to get it done. And that right there, belief in our ability to get through whatever is ahead, is an example of strong self-efficacy. turns out that its presence or absence in us affects how we will perform in ultras and perform in just about everything. And so we're going to talk about the psychology of it. And for me, especially um, when I'm doing 100 mile races, you know, 50 mile races, I get on the starting line. I know I'm going to finish. Yeah, no matter how bad I feel, because unless I miss the cutoffs, but I know I can pull it off. Um, don't really do many 100Ks. 12 hour races, same thing. I know I can do a decent performance, but I'll tell you, 100 mile races, I've done 19 races of 100 miles or longer. And I tell everybody, you know, even on the 19th one, you know, you get to that 80 mile range and you just kind of like, yeah, I just don't want to do this. I don't think I can make it. I don't want to make it. I just want to curl up and go to sleep. And then, you know, you push through. And then eventually it starts rolling downhill and you can pull it off. But it's just definitely the make or break time. And for a lot of us, that's, you know, two or three in the morning, the witching hour. And, you know, looking at having to do another marathon after doing three marathons is definitely not an appealing thing. And I ran into, I think, really um, my self-efficacy in 2019 took a big hit in that, I, you know, I've talked about like the 72-hour race, got to 75 miles, pulled the plug. And then, of course, at the dome. So it's not exactly the same thing. So this all comes from social cognitive theory. Um, there is the brainchild of a Dr. Albert Badura, who is probably the most cited living psychologist around. States that individuals are active participants who regulate their cognitions and behavior as opposed to just passively reacting to the environment. Self-efficacy is one of the most prominent sub-theories come out of social cognitive theory. Focus on one's belief and their capabilities to mobilize the motivation, cognitive resources, a course of action required to meet the situational demands. Essentially, you gain confidence in your abilities because you practice skills for your event, you have trained and otherwise prepared, you're emotionally prepared, you can anticipate what may happen, and you're motivated by the challenge. You have the courage to start the event. And all this is continually strengthened via positively reinforced repetition. And I can definitely say that, you know, you're just, and that's why I often talk about pe to people who are training for races. I mean, a perfect example is I've helped, I've worked with people and got him to qualify for bad water. But then these individuals, bad water, you know, how all you pretty much know, is, you know, it's a 135 mile race. It's all on pavement. And I'll tell people, you know, you need to train on the pavement. And they're out running on trails. And I'm, and they're more of a trail runner. And so you're always like, then why in the world do you ever want to do bad water? Now, the jester and I, we love the roads. We kind of came up in the, on the road system, you know, both of us ran marathons 40 years ago when we were in high school. And so more of you newer runners just love the trails and you like the distraction of the trails. Well, if you're training for bad water, you know, it's just all about putting it into a low gear and moving forward. When you're on the trails, there's all kinds of variety, not just a stimulus, but also up and down. So you're walking, you're running, you're sprinting, you're jumping over rocks. Bad water, you're doing the same damn thing for a long time. And so you're, you know, kind of talk in this article, you're not preparing yourself for what's going to lay ahead. And another thing a lot of people look at, you know, just use that as an example, they're used to finishing a, you know, a hundred mile race in under 24 hours or under 30 hours. And you get out there and all of a sudden you realize, you know, they give you 48 and you got to, when you get on the starting line, accept the fact that you're going to be out there for 48 hours. Same thing goes with the Barclay. I remember that guy that Brent Moen, who's finished it three times. That's what he says, why so many people fail. You know, you can be a great runner, but if you don't accept that, you know, 60 hours and you get 12 hours a lap, you're not getting done earlier. So that's kind of the whole mindset you need to have. 
Obviously you need the physical tools, you need the ability to persevere and harden yourself and you should do that in your training as well. But you know, the bottom line is if you don't have the mental skills, you're gonna have issues. When I was coaching high school cross country, we had kids who were, I would consider practice ponies. All those workouts, they would just be crushing it. But then on race day, they didn't do so well. They just just didn't have what it took. Now it's interesting, my oldest son, who never run a step in his life till his freshman year, he was not a practice pony. We had to drag him through workouts. He was always in the back. But you know what? When game time came, he was a show day race pony. He was a race guy. He just jumped in. And um, I think a lot of it with him was, especially his first couple of years of running, he just ran because he knew I liked him to run. And he enjoyed it to a point. But he wasn't really competitive. So he didn't let a lot of the self-doubt and things like that creep in. And, of course, he, you know, obviously um, had those, uh, those mental capabilities, you know, and I haven't told the story in quite some time, but, you know, he went to junior college before he went to high school. He was uh, diagnosed with Asperger's, and so he definitely didn't have, you know, those nagging doubts and things like that. So that's kind of the thing. It says, in general, athletes with high self-efficacy are more likely to pursue challenging goals, cope with pain, continue perseverance through setbacks, while athletes with low self-efficacy are more likely to avoid conf challenges and give up when they are confronted by obstacles. This is because athletes with high levels of self-efficacy are more willing to spend energy, have more robust confidence, and are more result in their efforts. These traits are particularly relevant to handling the psychological demands of ultras, such as dealing with pain and discomfort, pacing a litany of environmental and performance stressors, motivation to continue. What this boils down to is ultra athletes with self low self-efficacy are much less likely to persist, perform, compete, or even start these events. You know, and the great Anne Treston says that, you know, ultras is all about problem solving. And if you go into these races thinking, you know, you're not going to have problems, that it's going to be a perfect day, it's going to be really difficult for you. It's kind of like they're talking about this year at Barkley where, you know, you only had two guys finish the fun run. And when everybody's like, oh, you know, the weather, this, that, and everything, and everybody was like, oh, you go into Barkley with the hopes it's going to be a perfect day, you're in a lot of, lot of trouble. It's, you know, not going to be perfect. And I can tell you, you know, I mean, I've raced everything from the mile to a six day, you know, miles, you know, if you, things are off and you have a bad day, it's just a few seconds, same thing with 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons for me, you get the marathons, things kind of go sideways, the weather goes bad, you know, you've got to dial it down. That's another big thing. And I think because so many people, and partly it's because you have a job, and family, you get out, and I always recommend working out in the morning, but when you get into ultras, you know, mornings are fine when you're a, a recreational road runner, because most races are in the mornings, but if you're always training when it's ideal, and then you get in a race like an ultra where you're out there night and day, and so I recommend, you know, getting out and seeking the heat of the day, you know, embrace the suck, and that's going to just help you on race day to realize, you know, shit goes south, you know, and I'm right now in a transition period myself, 2019, as I've said, I'm, I just kind of lost the game in my head. And then, of course, 2020, a year ago, I had that fall and this whole heart failure stuff. And so right now, I'm just trying to put this back together. And that's why I'm working on more like <laughs> speed is a relative thing. I'm now purely walking. But, you know, I have a goal of like walking a sub three-hour half marathon. Back in the day, I used to run marathons under three. And so those are kind of things. And then I'm hoping that will bring me back to doing some events. I'm going to plan on like crewing and pacing ultras and reporting on them, but I'm really gonna try and keep myself from signing up. The only one I've got signed up is a 48 with uh, one of my podcast guests, Craig Simmons, who is the RD up there at Ride to Tie. It's gotten warm enough in here, even though it is warm outside, to take off that parka. You often probably see me wearing that thing. Uh, you know, years ago I said, like 2014 across years, out there in Phoenix in the 20 degree weather for six days, I broke my thermostat and I'm always cold. My kids kind of make fun of me going, why are you wearing a park? It's 70 out. So I'm awfully chilly. One of the things fascinating sides on this whole thing is now it sounds kind of like, you know, blowing smoke that, okay, you know, you're just big, bad, tougher and all that. And it's, nope, it's kind of goes with what you probably have now figured out. I'm sort of addicted to endurance sports. And it says that ultra runners with high levels of self-efficacy are often considered to be more resilient and mentally tough is perceived because they uh, uh, it's been linked to androgynous opioid activation, literally allowing athletes to buffer pain via their own endocrine system. And so that's pretty much what it is. It's not like, you know, 
in my head like you know okay tough it out suck it up it's more just that my endocrine system for whatever reason and it's basically evolutionary i'm sure you know i get high on my own supply often when i'm doing multi-day races i love it because i spend lots of time with people and you know they talk to me and i say you know i've got some you know inherent naturally you know just things that i'm born with you know this whole obviously the opiate uh, kind of thing and you know the ability not to have to sleep and get function really well I've been watching these videos the past week you know I've been functioning on two or three hours of sleep and that's fine and dandy it's just that it makes the days really long so say you're you know not naturally gifted in this kind of thing you there are things you can utilize to make yourself a better runner and one of them is utilize reflection we know that reflecting on past positive successful performance helps to Establish self-efficacy, and once you've established it, failures will cause more of a small ripple in your belief system than a big wave that knocks us down. As you prepare for a challenge, take time to look back at when you were successful in similar situations. And that's a key right there. I meet so many people, and I love meeting them and talking to them. And we'll be out at a 100-mile race or something, 50-mile race. A lot of times it's a 100-mile race, and I'll start talking to these people, and they may have had problems like they did okay in 50 Ks, 50 miles, they jumped up to 100 and have issues. And then when I say, well, hey, you know, what's your 10K time? What's your half marathon, you know, 10K time or mile time? And I, oh, no, I read this book or I heard this. And I just, my first race of my life was an ultra. Now, the Jester's first race was Nanny Goat, 100 miler, and an ultra world. I mean, he ran some marathons way back in the day. And see, since I came up in the system, you do like mile races and 5K races to learn a lot of lessons. But they're, not, they're like small little science experiments where they're not going to blow up in your face. But if you've never really run and then you're, you know, whatever, in your 20s or 30s and you show up the starting line at a 50 mile or 100 mile race and you've read and listened to things and you think it's going to happen and then things go sideways, well, you're going to dwell on that and each one it kind of just keeps you in that mindset. So, you know, I highly recommend, I tell people all the time, ultra runners, you know, Go out and run local 5Ks and 10Ks. Just do it all. You know, it comes off in handy. Like I've often said, too, about, you know, into the BB Farm 48. Wasn't having a particularly good race. Um, ended up, you know, thought, well, maybe I'll get to 120 miles. But then with an hour to go, this young guy who was in his 30s and his girlfriend, they were running laps. And I thought I had a two-lap lead on him. thought I had two miles on him. Well, I only had a mile lead on him. And he hunted me down that whole last hour. I think I ran my fastest 5K of the year at the end of a 48-hour race because I'd been dogging it. And I ended up taking third overall male by 60 yards. But it was, I had the belief in it. I had, you know, so um, the great, you know, everybody says um, Bill Schultz, great six-day racer, race director, has done races across Americas. And he says, you know, every race is a mile. There's four parts, you know, first lap, second lap, third lap, fourth lap. And so if you can go off and do these shorter races, you can just get more reps. And it's all important about getting reps. It's kind of that whole Malcolm Gladwell type of thing. And of course, practice makes permanent. The more you practice skills successfully by stacking up quality runs or finishing a 50 mile before 100 mile, the stronger your beliefs become. This is because complete... Completing similar versions of the skill allows you to grow all three planes of efficacy, level, general, and strength, which leaves you with the belief that you can accomplish similar or even more difficult tasks. And that's, again, like I'm saying, you have so many people out there, and I get it, you're excited, and you know, you can still jump into your ultra, but in between your ultra, instead of doing speed work on your own, jump into 5Ks and 10Ks and hard trail runs and things that are going to be difficult just to get, you know, and oh, a perfect thing, especially if you're looking at doing where you're going to be out there for a long time. Join your local hike club, hike with them, learn how to hike well, and then go do one of these one-day classics. Out here in California, we're blessed with lots of one-day hikes like Ray Lakes Loop, which is like a 40-mile loop that I've done in 16, 17 hours. Mount Whitney, it'll take me, I think the best I've ever done Whitney is like seven up, six down, so it's an all-day affair. Just getting time on your feet and having to deal with all kinds of issues and problems and altitude and rocky trails. And so... Do that kind of things when you're preparing for a difficult adventure. You know, just putting yourself in difficult, stressful situations and overcoming them, and then you can use those later on in other difficult tasks. Another suggestion they have is be your own cheerleader, or better yet, be a good cheerleader for those around you. Raise each other up. Find mentors in the form of a coach or a peer to provide feedback. This type of encouragement from a value support member is a strong belief builder. Additionally, opt into positive self-talk. Not only can positive self-talk increase efficiency, but it also increases attentional focus and emotional control. 
And, you know, I find this very key. You know, you, if you can find someone who has a belief in you and your abilities, and I've done that with many people, they'll come to me and I say, you know, you can do it. And having someone, and again, I think I had benefit because I came up through the system running in high school, running in college with the coaches and support. And so when you get into the sport later in life, you don't really have it. All your friends think you're crazy. Your spouse thinks you're crazy for doing it. You know, they, they'll support you, but they just don't really understand what's going on. And then another one is emulate success. Finding a model, be, finding a role model, be a role model, and a structural model, and coping model can increase um, your successful behavior either by seeing someone like you break through or watching yourself or someone else make progress gradually helps build this efficacy. And, you know, I myself, that's one of the reasons I do these videos. And the reason I love racing is people see me, you know, I'm 50, almost 58 years old, 250 pounds. But over the past decade, I've did all these ultras and I'm usually the biggest thing out there. And I remember one story that was really great was Beyond Limits, which I don't think I'm going to race this year. I'm hoping to maybe get out there. I've got some commitments that I, and I really wasn't wanting to sign up because I'm not quite ready to get back. But I was there one year, I think it was the first year, and you know they got great food. They had this one guy barbecuing like burgers and hot dogs, vegan options too. And uh, notice him, he's a big guy. He's like 6'6", 350 pounds or something. Big, big guy. And, you know, said hello to him. And then I go back the next year, and the great thing about the Beyond Limits race is it's in these bunk houses, and they assign you a bunk. And I, that year, I, I loved them for it. They actually put me in a room with Joe Fee, just kind of a separate room. You know, Joe Fegis is the American record holder in a six-day race, 606 miles. They put me in there. I didn't feel comfortable being in the room because I do snore, and I didn't really want to disturb him. So I ended up grabbing my stuff and was going to go sleep out, like, in the living room. And it was also, I just kind of, I thought, you know, I'll let Joe have this because it was a fairly small room. I think it was, like, more for, like, the camp counselor. And so I let him have that room. So I'm out in the living room, and I'm a notoriously bad sleeper. But night before a race, I'm really bad. And I'm laying there, and there's the bathrooms with the showers, which is another reason Beyond Limits is great. You know, so it's got the bathroom door. I'm in the darkened living room, and you can see the light in the bathroom. And all of a sudden, the light disappears, and there's this gigantic shadow in front of me. And it turned out to be that guy, and God, I'm just going blank on his name right now. Sorry about that, but I had to get his name. Mark Jacoby from Nevada, Henderson, Nevada, which is where the Jackpot Ultra is. He is a referee for college football, and he runs the Boys and Girls Club. And so he is a 6'6", 300, former college football player, wears size 15 shoes. We were talking to him about finding ultras for himself. Well, he, um, you know, he was the guy coming out of the bathroom. And he saw that I was awake and he said, hey, Andy, I want, he, 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 he came over and started talking to me. And he goes, you know what? I was here last year cooking the burgers and stuff. And he said, I saw you going around and around all night and day. And I said, you know, someone big like that can do it. I can do it too. And he said he went home, started training and he came back that following year. He got his 50 mile finish. I remember being excited to see him out there. And then he also went to the jackpot race the following year got a 100k finish and then at six foot six 300 plus pounds big huge guy he finished 100 miles he signed up for 48 hour race and got a 100 mile finish just a phenomenal amazing performance and i will always remember that and with the, what i'm saying is you never know and they often say this you never know who's watching or like they often say as a parent you never know what the kids are seeing and what they're doing so always try and be a good role model, and I try and always do that if I can. Now, the last one on here, I kind of chuckle because I'm not necessarily this guy, but I guess I am. I know the gesture is this guy. It says, choose a half full glass. You're not always going to be situationally stoked, but recognizing that you have control over your own emotional state in response to most situations is important. That's because we know that negative emotional states are associated with lower self-efficacy and positive emotional states with higher self-efficacy. And I think so. I think I like reading that because it's not more that like, you know, um, half glass full or whatever. It's kind of like, I know things are going to go bad. And so I don't let myself get down in the dumps. And I would say one thing that really comes with experience, especially in really long races, is when you're new to the sport, um, you, you know, going along, going along, and then all things just fall apart. When you've been in a sport for a while, and it's kind of my problem now, is 
one, you know things are going to go bad. When you're a newbie, you sometimes think, oh, I might have a perfect race. You know things are going to go bad, but you can also feel yourself descending. So it's kind of like if you're new to the sport and don't have experience, it's like being in an elevator and uh, and the elevator is kind of crashing down to the basement. Whereas if you're in our experience, it's kind of like you were on a level floor and now you're going downstairs and you know you're going down, but you know you can probably turn and you're going to be able to climb back out of these stairs. So when you do a slowly descent into uh, here, you know that you can pull it back out because that's one of the things that's great about doing these races is you know you're going to get better for the most part. But when you're new, you're going along like this and all of a sudden, boom, and now you're all of a sudden in the basement looking up at the broken cable going, what the hell do I, you know, oh my God, I'm done. And then of course, you're there with inexperienced people, your crew and your family who may not know, and they are concerned about your well-being, and they can talk you out of it. And so I often say when you're going to do something very difficult, especially, you know, race, to like leave the friends and family at home. you got so much things to concentrate on and pay attention to. You don't need to be worried about how they're doing and feeling, and you need to just take care of yourself. And you also don't want them there because they're like, oh, dad, or, or, or you know, honey, you know, stop, you're hurting yourself. You need to find someone, a veteran person who's been there and will be like, okay, we know it sucks. Do this, this, and this, suck it up, let's go. And you need some tough love and a kick in the shorts. And, you know, if you're ever looking for someone like that, you know, contact myself. I crew and pace people all the time have in the past and enjoy traveling and it's something i really look forward to doing and you know you also can just reach out in the local community you know and especially like this new clubhouse thing you know i'm meeting people from all around the world in just the past couple of days and it's a very fun experience so that is and i've butchered the name many times self-efficacy um, it's something that you may not even thought about in your running or in your life but it's definitely a tool that you can definitely use and as always stay healthy be Boring, not epic.